Patrick McCabe is one of Ireland's most celebrated and respected writers, award-winning works, The Butcher Boy, Breakfast at Pluto, Winterwood, uh, to name just a few of the accolades uh, that he has garnered. Next month he brings us yet another work. It's a new play called The Bridge Below Town and that will tour nationwide. And Pat McCabe is with me. Pat, good morning. Good morning, Pat. How are you? Um, I almost didn't recognise you. The beard is gone. Yeah, keeping ahead of the posse, Pat. They won't find me now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first man in Ireland to disguise to himself by beard. shaving the yes, beard. Yes, like Bono taking off his glasses. Nobody recognises him. <laughs> no one recognises him. <laughs> um, now, you've been a very busy man in the last while because uh, you had a recent project with RT, uh, The Play Next Door. Mm-hmm. And it, for you, it was nearly next door. It was. It was in Castle Blaney, which is about 25 miles from Clonus. But it was a very interesting project and a very courageous kind of thing for RTE to do. And I think it turned out to be quite a success, really, certainly. Yeah. What did you have to do? Basically, you went to uh, a, a place uh, that was chosen by, really, the producers. In, in Fiona Looney's case, it was Thurlis, which was a pub in Thurlis. A disused pub there. And uh, Dirty Purcells was the famous Brayhead Hotel. And mine was uh, a McMansion outside Castle Blaney. Uh, and that's, they send you there and you have to... Yeah, you get on with it. It's kind of a reality TV show yeah. in a way. You know, yeah. it's kind of a, a, different, a different spin on it. It sounds like a fun thing to do, but you wonder why they didn't send you to somewhere like maybe Finglas or Montanotti rather than so close to your home place. Oh, well, if they wanted to try me again, I'd go to, I'd go to Montanotti. Because <laughs> no there could problem. be slings and arrows well, in County could, Monaghan. But I suppose to some extent, you know, whatever hope you had of writing a play, because a play in a month is a pretty tall order yeah. for, for anybody, it was that it's a, I always like to have some kind of links, you know, with the area culturally. So it might have been bit of a shambles if they'd sent me to Montenegro. Well, at least the dialogue will be true. Well, hopefully. True to itself. Um, You're you're a full-time writer for how many years now? About 20 years now. That transition from being a teacher Mm. to writer, was that a difficult one for you? Extremely difficult, you know, and uh, a lot of people now uh, seem to be more... uh, uh, ambitious or aspirant writers now than ever there were. If you open The Guardian now, you'll see, you know, page after page of writing classes, master classes. Now, at a time when the publishing world appears to be shrinking, this whole kind of... I suppose it's the leisure society to some extent. But in my case, I'd been teaching for 17 years, which was quite a long time because I was never a a bohemian in that sense. I always felt that, you know, for this to work, it has to make some kind of economic sense as well. So the, there was no garret to which you wanted to repair. You'd prefer to live in a house with your family. Well, it's all very well talking about garrets and everything else, you know, but I think a writer's the same right to a domestic kind of peace and, you know, ordinariness yeah. as everybody else. And what was the moment of liberation where you felt... Oh, they got a lo- loan from the credit union. <laughs> 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 no, it actually it was when Neil Jordan bought the rights to the butcher yeah. boy. That was, and that, that gave was, you a little bit of breathing space. It gave me space. quite a lot of breathing space because a movie at that time, you know, it goes in, in, in cycles, really, the whole movie business at that time. You know, though Jim Sheridan was in the ascendant, and you know Ireland was very, very hot, I suppose yeah. you could say, and that changes. It goes on to Scotland or India or wherever. But at that time, you just get lucky once. Yeah. You know? Now, the the Butch Boy is a very unusual book, and it became a very unusual movie. Mm. Um, was that a struggle to get it done uh, so that it would be true to uh, your vision? I know books and movies are always different mm. because you know mm. a paragraph. Um, well, a chapter can be translated into one look from a character. Absolutely. And I mean, sometimes you get writers complaining about it, but if they get, you know, a wheelbarrow load of gold sovereigns, I don't know what they're complaining <laughs> about. In my case, that didn't happen because I was fortunate enough because Neil Jordan, who was a writer I had great time for, I really loved his work and still do. You know, I think Mistaken is probably one of the finest books ever written about mm. Dublin, for example. But... Um, because he was interested in the language and because he was interested in the world, he was very protective of it as well. So it was a kind of a, a paradise situation for me, you know. I can't imagine it ever happening again. Yeah. Um, with Breakfast at Pluto, I mean, that was the same sort of endeavour. It was, and uh, who had a huge input into that was Killian Murphy, who now mm. is, you know, a world famous movie star with Ke- Peaky Blinders and so on. And he kind of pushed that with Alan Maloney. So you, lightning shouldn't strike twice, but in my case, it did. So. Now, uh, the business of of writing, are you disciplined? Are you sort of get up at eight o'clock in the morning, have the coffee, sit down, work until 12, um, have lunch, review, rewrite? Or are you more disparate in your approach? Well, I think if you're disparate in your approach, you'll you'll be a long time waiting for the muse to strike. You know what I mean? I think that, uh, I mean, if you take James Joyce, who was always my kind of idol, um, James Joyce probably sank enough 
you know, red wine to sink a ship every night of the week. But he was always at his desk the next morning. Now, I'm not saying it had anything to do with drinking red wine, but the principle always was that you should be at your desk. It's a job. Well, it's very much so. Yeah. So, but therefore, it's a classic you behave like Classic it. vocation. Yeah. It's, it's very, very difficult. It's a bit more like weaving, you know, that you have to go back to the loom every day. Every time you drop a stitch, you know, it'll be really, really difficult to pick up the time. You lose two or three days each time. Yeah. Uh, have you ever suffered from a protracted period of writer's block? Yeah. And my wife says there's no milk and there's no tea. Then mysteriously <laughs> it comes back. You know, really? Yes, it does. Because it's, you know, it's, sometimes that's a narcissistic indulgence. I think People like to say, oh, I'm blocked. Clip yeah. in the ear is no harm for people to say that. A clip in the ear. Yeah. That's what they deserve. That being indulgent. So. I think so, yeah. You're a professional. Get on with it. I would have thought so, yeah. Mm. I, I presume that the way through a block anyway is just to keep writing stuff and then look at it and, if necessary, just throw it out. That's not to say, you know, that, uh, that maybe there are times when I should have been blocked. You know, <laughs> people have said, you know, what are you producing this, you know, cardload of bills for? You know, I've had my times when maybe the work wasn't up to perhaps what it, the scratch it should have been. But, you know... And do you have favourites like uh, you don't have favourite children? That's not possible. But, no. Um, do you have favourites that you say um, that's that's perfection or close to perfection? Yeah, but it's always the one that everybody hated. <laughs> like I had a book called the, the Emerald Germs of Ireland, which was actually written as a sort of a pastiche of all the old Walton's Music Society kind of ball fireside ballad books. Yeah. Right. You know, where you have, uh, you know, a little cat sitting by the fire. There's a turf fire. There's an old lady in the corner with glasses knitting and there's Farmer Joe in the corner. And that was the idea. It was to be like our boys or Ireland's own, yeah. but nobody got the joke. So it was actually published as a serious novel, you know, and people say, oh, he investigates the mind of the psychopathic mind of the serial killer. That was not its intent. It was, it was never intended anything like that, with the result that it was absolutely crucified from a height without <laughs> exception. And that's my favourite book. Yeah. And actually, if I could bring it back to the, the, the drama side of things, Porrick McIntyre, who directed The Bridge Below the Town, he and Aaron Monaghan, who's probably one of the finest actors in Ireland or these islands at the moment, uh, they put on um, a production of Emerald Germs of Ireland in a field with just yeah. the two of them. And I'd say it was one of the most astounding. That was under the auspices of Living Dread, who produced yeah. The Bridge Below the Town. Yeah, I'd say it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And that's, that was because everybody else hated it. And now I, I'm able to say that. But they just didn't get the point of it. I they mean, didn't get it on the page, but they got it when it was produced yeah. as a play. We were talking to Jeremy Ferreter the other day about John B. Keane. Yes. And, you know, his canon of works, which are esteemed, um, also side by side with him is a whole bundle of stuff that's purely for entertainment, shall we say. So letters for... The letters, to, yeah, Love yes, Hungry Farmer. Love, and, love Hungry Farmer. Yeah. So, yeah, they always turn up on these newsstands in the west yeah. of Ireland, little shops, the Mercy yeah. Press kind of books, aren't they? The letters of a Love Hungry Farmer. Yeah, well, I remember as a child we used to get these Catholic Truth Society pamphlets. Did you see they've been recently republished in a no. book form? Yeah, as Sister Felicia wins a bicycle. Oh. That was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, so they're magnificent because they've got these kind of expressionistic covers like detective novels. Mm. You know, may I keep company? The power of prayer. You may indeed, <laughs> indeed, you may not keep company, says Father German. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's something to be mined there, I, I suspect. I'm already out. <laughs> the reason I was thinking of John Bikin, though, is that uh, taking um, the the local and turning it into the universal, which is something yeah. that you've you've done. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing about drama that I find very exciting now is the collaborative nature of it. There's a whole new generation coming through in Cavan and other places, you know, where, you know, they have access to technology and modernism. And I've always been very, very interested in it. Like uh, the interesting aspect of perhaps of the bridge below the town for people who might be interested in going to see it is that it's, it's set, shall we say, it's set on, on the cusp when of that period in Ireland when W.C. Fields, Al Jolson and the Andrews sisters and all people like that are giving way to Burt Bacharach and the Beatles. So it's located okay. in there somewhere, you know, it's almost like a rural 3D fantasia, you know, and glorious Technicolor. I kind of think of it like uh, Alfred Hitchcock directs Tolka Row or something <laughs> like that, you know, with Doris Day. And, and you know, what it is is... Uh, so so is, is life is changing. Life is it's not changing dramatically as it would have in our time where you had the technology and the internet. Bang, yeah. we woke up one morning, you know, and our mobile phone was a tracking device. It, it was coming yeah. a little bit slower than that. But nonetheless, it was the beginning of what we now know as modernism. And the rural plays of John B. Keane 
Um, I love them in many ways, but I always felt that perhaps, you know, that there was a, an element there of modernism that I missed. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it's funny. I, I got a, an email from uh, uh, Ursula and Ted um, and they sent me this email which said uh, they saw the first production of Sive way back. And it was, I think, a touring from Kerry, went into the Cork Opera House or whatever, or the Everyman. And uh, they heard two Kerry people talking about it on the way out and they couldn't see anything in it. It's so ordinary. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in other words, the playwright had captured the voice of the people pretty exactly. Yes. And they couldn't see it therefore. This is just life as we know it. What are you what are you on about? This is not a play. This is just ordinary. That happens all the time, you know. Like I mean, I wrote a play one time. It was called Frank Pig says hello and uh one of the lines in it was a young boy who said uh on a little fellow came to the school he said there was an English chap and he said come on we'll ask him has he any comics and he said have you got any Dandy Beano Topper Victor Hornet Hotspur Hurricane Diana Bunty Judy and Commandos <laughs> right and the guy that was at the the, the play who is an old friend of mine said where did you get the idea for that and it was him that had said it <laughs> but nobody ever expects to see themselves or their, you know the, the, the dross of their own experience being mined into gold they don't kind of value their own language sometimes Now uh, I noticed by the way when you were talking about the cusp that you used the the, the musical uh, gradation as we move from one era. Music is so much part of everything you do, isn't it? Well, I think that, you know, sometimes when you see plays about the 50s, there's a tendency to focus on the externals, you know, on the drab, black and white kind of world of the workaday kind of uh, drudgery of bringing coal in from the coal house, washing it. But there was a huge, lively imagination. The amount of singing that went on in the back lane outside my house when, or our house when I was a kid. You know, those crazy sort of 50 songs, you know, she wears red feathers and a hula hula mm. skirt, you know, or uh, particularly, you see, The Bridge Below the Town was on an album um, by Eileen Donaghy and Bridie Gallagher, those kind of so who put the overalls and Mrs. Murphy's chowder and all the you know all those kind of music hall songs, which people listened to far more than they did traditional music mm -hmm. because the revolution hadn't broken with the flak holes and everything at that time. You know, so the bridge below the town was written by um, Frank O'Donovan, who played Batty Brennan in the Reardons. Yeah. You may remember. And I think everybody kind of half remembers these tunes. So there's a kind of a, a rural kind of authenticity about it. But there's also bringing in the elements of Americana, European kind of thing. And, you know, people through Catholicism and particularly the cinema lived really rich, imaginative lives, I think. Mm. And I think sometimes that's forgotten and it's often found in the language. You know, there is a tendency, you know, for the the contemporary mind to suffer from what J.G. Farr called the condescension of posterity, of, of looking down on the 50, of what we will say about this age in 50 years time will probably yeah. be similar to what, you know. Yeah, but we're telling. living the now. And it's our now. It is, of course. But, you know, it's not a, it's not as different as we think from the now yeah. of, you know. Because they felt they were, as they saw the first Ford Anglia coming down the main street, they thought they were incredibly modern, but as we do now. It probably even was more modern because, you know, it, 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 you know, you could spend more time. So little happened that this, this Anglia, you could get <laughs> three or four months mileage. And that's what I was kind of thinking of as an alternate title for The Bridge Below the Town was a Massey Ferguson named Desire. <laughs> 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 because... <laughs> because, you know, it has the colours of a streetcar named Desire. Long day's really journey into Clonus. A long, <laughs> a long day's journey, no, a long day's journey into Bellyborough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the thing about it is that uh, Laurel and Hardy and Al Jolson and all those things, you know, the, the currency of the language around those things was incredibly rich. And I, I think sometimes... That, that there's not enough attention paid to this rich imagination. It's a Catholic imagination, essentially. It's big, it's transfigurative, it's full of colour. And the the colours of the bridge below the town are the, are the, the Hitchcockian colours of Marnie and Vertigo and those yeah. things like that. The, the, the music thing you refer to, I mean, I don't know what it's like in, in, in rural France or in rural Portugal or whatever, but you ever notice that even the trendiest of young people um, add a few drinks and a wedding and suddenly they're singing... All the old traditional it's probably like songs, Italy, and you know, and uh, Scotland as well. Remember the yeah. Billy Connolly, <laughs> you know, like, and we have the old rugged cross in this one as well, which is one of those classics. I don't know if you get it so much now as you did with that generation, the seventy. Tell us, is, it's going on tour. It is, thankfully. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, you've uh, talked about the period. What is uh, as much as you want to share with us the mm -hmm. conceit of the play? Basically, the conceit of the play is that. Um, 
a very ordinary couple, undemonstrative, you know, God fearing, decent people, fall in love, they get married, and it's almost like a, a cross section of their minds and their lives. There's a tragedy at the heart of it in that a child is tragically drowned. And they, in those days, there was what was euphemistically termed as nerves. A woman nerves, would yeah. get to a certain period and it would mysteriously disappear. Big families and all the rest, probably through sheer exhaustion. And she said, she has the nerves. nerves. So it's all about the secrets. Now, it's, it's in no way kind of um, miserableist. It's not, because the older you get, you realise that people come Want through... Want to be entertained. It's certainly entertainment is at the heart yeah. of it, because I don't think there's any point, in, in the, certainly in the modern age, with all the demands of people's time, of dragging them along, you know, to dress somebody up in a unitard, to stand on their head, speaking yeah. some kind of gibberish, painting themselves blue. And we go away thinking, yeah, that was amazing. What did, what was it all about? Nobody knows, least of all the actor. probably. <laughs> but so it's not like that. It's very much in the tradition of, uh, you know, widescreen Technicolor movies of the like you could almost think of it as Doris Day in the Reardon's or, Tol- or Tolga Row. Right. Or it's uh, showing or playing in the Civic it, Theatre. It, it, it's in the through the NASC Theatre Network who are magnificently bringing it to the Pavilion in Dunleary, the Civic in Talla, the Raymer Theatre where it's opening on Friday in Virginia and County Cavan, the Shame Stitch here. So it's a very big tour. It's all available okay. on the net. Soon to be seen at a venue near you. That's basically at the bridge below the town. And it's author Patrick McCabe. Thank you very much for uh, joining us.